Welcome to Education Matters presented by the Public School Forum of North Carolina. I'm your host, Tom Williams. This year, North Carolinians will elect a new state superintendent of public instruction as the current state superintendent, Mark Johnson, has announced he will run for lieutenant governor. Today, we continue our series of interviewing those who have decided to run for state superintendent. We will talk with Representative Crane Horn, a Republican from Union County, who has chaired the Education Committee in the North Carolina General Assembly. We'll also talk with Constant Love Johnson, a former educator and consultant who is running as a Democrat for the Office of State Superintendent. Before we talk, tackle our main topics, we open with headlines, our quick scan of education headlines across North Carolina and the U.S. While Spanish remains the most spoken by English learners in schools, other languages are rising up. The number of Arabic-speaking English learners in the nation's K-12 public schools has increased 75 percent over the past eight years. While it still accounts for only 2.5 percent of the entire English learning student population, it has now risen above Chinese languages, which accounts for 1.9 percent of English learning students. Stanford University studied the impact of the term fake news when it comes to student education. It turns out that high school students are having a harder time differentiating fact from fiction, as well as deciding which online news stories are from trustworthy sources. The study argues that there is a higher need for digital literacy lessons in the classroom, as well as new research-based strategies. California, where class sizes were reduced, to Denver, Colorado, where teachers received 7 to 10 percent pay increases, the Red for Ed movement caused sweeping changes across the nation. Now in 2020, there are already plans for rallies in Tennessee over funding and testing, as well as in Florida and in other states. While the Red for Ed movement continues into the new year, the NEA found that the national average teacher salary has actually declined by 4.5 percent over the past decade, adjusted for inflation. But a national poll shows that 74 percent of parents support their community's teachers striking for higher pay. We'll have more on this topic as the year progresses. Remember, you can visit the Public School Forum's website at ncforum.org, click Education Matters, and read more about each of the headlines, as well as other topics we cover each week. I'd like to welcome to the show Representative Craig Horn, a Republican from Union County, who is running for State Superintendent of Public Instruction. Thank you so much, Representative Horde, for joining us today. Thank you, Tom, for having me on. We're delighted to have you here. Thanks. So if you will, open up by sharing with us one aspect of your uh, professional experience that you feel like has most contributed to preparing you for this uh, candidacy. I think the most, uh, the most important aspect of my background and my experience in the legislature and in life is my ability to bring people together of disparate views uh, disparate parties, if you will, different parts of the country, different economic stratus, and get them to work together to find out what it is we can agree on and work from there. Uh, that's my goal as superintendent. So if you look forward, you're elected state superintendent. After your first three years in office, what would you point to as measures of your positive impact in North Carolina? Well, as you may know, I've been in office now. I'm in my 10th year, my fifth term. And there are a number of things that I'm very proud of that I've accomplished since I've come to office. Uh, included in those are such things as Kylo's Law, one of the nation's premier child abuse laws that, uh, to deal with child abuse issues. I've also championed drug abuse issues way back to when we were dealing with artificial cannabinoids such as K2 and Spice, as well as methamphetamine and now opioid addiction. When it comes to education in particular, I champion the advanced teaching roles, a, a system that is critical for us to be able to attract and retain teachers, or let them be teachers, stay in the classroom, and still grow in their career. And finally, we, as you know, Tom, we're the only state in the nation, we were the first state in the nation where every classroom has access to wireless broadband. That's a huge advantage for our students. Now the challenge is, how do we make sure that we're taking a proper advantage of that opportunity? You've been around, you've seen um, education policy up close and personal. Um, and over the years, North Carolina's model of shared governance sometimes appear to be disconnected, disjointed, and sometimes problematic uh, in our efforts to improve schools. 
Um, what would you do in this current model operating as state superintendent that would help the school governance model function more effectively and better serve the students across North Carolina? Well, there are many things that need to be done in that area, none the least of which is to reach out to our teachers and, and our students and the parents and get them involved in the delivery of education. Sadly, PTA attendance has dropped off, parental involvement has dropped off. We all know clearly that the more attentive a, a parent is, the more successful a child is. Now, that's not in every case, but is in the great majority of cases. So as superintendent, it will be my responsibility, and I will take the initiative to reach out, listen to the teachers, meet with them, listen to parents, meet with them, be at the PTA meetings all across this state, involve the people that actually have to implement our policies in, in, in creating the policies. I think that's the strength I bring to the, to the table. So when you're kind of looking more internally at it, um, Representative Horn, and you're thinking about your relationship as state superintendent with the state board and their relationship with the governor and all of their relationships with the General Assembly, what have you seen works best in those relationships? What are the things that you'd want to stay away from? Well, what works best is when we talk to each other rather than at each other. What works best is when we do our homework, look behind the curtain, so to speak. There's more to every story. I don't care what the story is. People come to the General Assembly from all parts of the state, and not all the members of the General Assembly or the governance in, in North Carolina, not all people are originally from North Carolina. We need to be able to establish a clear, open, and comfortable means of communication. What would I stay away from? Well, I'd stay away from arguments. There's no point in, in arguing and, put, and painting people into a corner. I like the approach of, can we at least agree on X. And let's work from there. Let's focus on what we can agree on and build from that. And it's amazing when we do that how often we'll pick off some of those things on which we don't agree and we will then create an atmosphere of cooperation. And that should be the key. You mentioned it a little bit earlier in your comments around um, the importance of teaching and teacher pay and teacher recruitment. Yes. Um, in light of the recent West Ed report, the recommendations related to Leandro, when you look at the larger picture and strategies around teacher recruitment, retention, and support, what um, do you see specifically can be done to help avert the crisis in our local communities of securing high quality teachers? We have to raise the bar across the board. That includes the bar for teacher pay the bar for teacher professional development and prove that expanded. Teachers love education. That's why they're in education. Mm -hmm. They want their professional development to be quality professional development. Mm -hmm. We have to ensure that teachers have an opportunity to grow in their profession and not force them out of the classroom in order to do that. Teachers entered the profession to teach. But, you know, we ask so much of our teachers. They are nurses and 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 first aiders and counselors, and then we wonder why they didn't get around to teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic, so to speak. So we've got to, somebody's got to have their back, and I intend to have their back and, and to listen to them. I have gone, for the last eight years, I've been going across this state, meeting with teachers in the classroom, privately, as groups, listening to their concerns, and trying to develop legislation and policies that address those concerns. I've not always been successful. There's 120 members of the House and 50 members of the Senate. That's a tall order. Right. That's a really tall order. Right. Yeah. Um, having been in the field and uh, in the arena, um, you're certainly no stranger to controversy. Last <laughs> summer, um, you were a huge proponent of the legislation that was going to look at a three-year pilot program of a virtual preschool program upstart. And, it generated a lot of discussion, it a did. lot of debate. Where do you stand on that issue and the idea of online preschool versus face-to-face -face personal interaction for preschool students? And how, where are you now and where would you be as a state superintendent? First and foremost, let me be very clear. Face-to-face, -face, personal touch, human beings touching human beings is the goal for every student and every young person in this state, absolutely. But there are some facts we must face, and those facts are that if we had unlimited space for 
early ed for North Carolina pre-K, we would still have hundreds, probably thousands of kids that would not be able to ac access that, whether it be for transportation issues, but far beyond transportation issues, it, home issues, illness issues, sports issues, all kinds of, of reasons that some of those kids, and generally it's the poorest of those kids, would not have access. Second point is that I made a big mistake. And the big mistake was that I let this program be characterized as virtual pre-K. Well, that's not the point at all. The, the, the program is, in fact, parental involvement. So if I come to you as a poor mom, a poor, some poor parents, and I say, I want you to be involved with your children and teaching them how to read and how to access education. And I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you with a coach. I'm going to help you with materials. And then I'm going to give you some additional support online and some reason to participate. Mm -hmm. So that's the key to the success of an option, one option, in delivering a quality early education experience. We have about 35 seconds. A closing thought on your candidacy and what you'd like the people in North Carolina to know about you as a wrap-up. Well, I have a passion for education. It often comes through when I, when I talk about it. I'm concerned about a great many things, and literacy is at top of the fold. We have got to teach our kids how to read on grade level. We, it's absolutely imperative. I think I can bring people together to focus on the important issues, find those things on which we can agree and build on them and deliver a quality educational experience for parents, for kids, and for teachers. Thank you, Representative Horn, so much Thank for you. being with you. Uh, it's been delightful to have you on the show again. After a brief commercial break, we'll be back to continue our discussion with Constant Love Johnson, a Democrat running for state superintendent of public construction. But first, see if you can answer this question. In what year did North Carolina have its first state superintendent of public instruction? Education Matters is brought to you each week in part by Paragon Bank, serving others, enriching lives. Welcome back to Education Matters. Did you correctly answer B, 1853? In that year, the state superintendent was an appointed office, but just over a decade later, the role was abolished, only to be then brought back in 1868 as an elected position. Joining us now is Constant Love Johnston, who is running for state superintendent of public instruction. Thank you for joining us, and we're delighted to have you here today. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Great. Open up and tell us a little bit about what you would say is the one aspect of your professional experience that you think has prepared you for your seeking the state superintendency here in North Carolina. I believe there are several different positions I've held and experiences I've had that prepared me for this opportunity. I, it's a great opportunity to serve North Carolina. I'm a fifth generation North Carolinian. And we've had about four generations of teachers in my family. So teaching and education is very important to me. My father is a 35-year teacher. What positions prepared me? I would say my teaching position. I've, I was a teacher. Um, I am a former counselor, school counselor, and a school administrator. I'm also a publisher of a political magazine. I believe that every step I've taken throughout my career has led me was, was perfectly designed for this position. I'm an awarded event planner. Um, as a teacher, I was made lead teacher within my third month being at the school and created lots of programs and created all types of ways to alleviate some of the stresses teachers had. And as a school counselor, I developed numerous programs for students who needed to experience preparing for their vocational careers and I put vocations first and made sure that they were aimed in, in the proper direction which is what I'll do Good. as superintendent. So as we look forward November comes and goes you're elected you're installed three years later what do you see three years later as measurable outcomes of the impact you've had as the state superintendent? Measurable outcomes are very very important that's what I feel is missing in this particular era of the public instruction department. When I look at these gaps, I see African American children, black children, at the bottom of every statistical uh, data source for our educational system. And that will change 
um, in my third year, you'll see significant differences and you'll see greater equity. Good. In looking at some of your um, background information and your platform, I know that you have in there that the U.S. Congress will step up to the plate and they'll ante up and help on teacher pay. Tell us what your vision is for that, how that would work, what it would mean here in North Carolina. Well, I've submitted a basic proposal to Alma Adams, Congresswoman Alma Adams, who is on the Labor and Education Committee of our U.S. Congress. I know that our state government is having issues with our budget and issues with teacher pay. And we can't continue in this manner. We have to make sure that our teachers have adequate pay to afford this cost of living in North Carolina. Now, North Carolina is not an expensive state. Um, it's not a state that's unaffordable. We can't um, call it uh, an abusive state when it comes mm -hmm. to pay. But when it comes to these teachers, this is abusive. Mm -hmm. So I believe that we need congressional assistance. We need supplements from our Congress. I know that that item does not presently exist on the budget. Right. <laughs> However, I do believe that it's possible. And I do believe the Congress prioritizes the education uh, of children, therefore prioritizes our teachers having the comfort, having the time, the creativity to make sure our students are successful yeah. and, and achieve. So I believe they will prioritize teachers. Okay. And I believe that there's a way to ensure that something that we've left behind on that budget that has not been spent can be turned around and maybe we can even determine if we can repeal some of these uh, or amend some of these laws to make sure that our bills can be reused or our, uh, the, uh, not bills be reused, but our budgetary items can be reused if not spent. Okay. But there are ways to, a Congress mm -hmm. and an assembly, right. is you know, they are responsible for amending bills changing, uh, amending laws, changing um, our understanding of which direction we could go okay. through bill writing. Good. So it's, it's important, I believe, that we not assume that what is presently in, in writing okay. and, uh, you know, according to the law cannot be amended. We can, kinda, we can make these changes. Let's kind of shift topics a little bit. Your position on charter schools in North Carolina and traditional public schools in North Carolina in terms of the relationship between them in terms of funding? Maybe a, your thoughts on those. Well, just as I mentioned, we have millions of dollars sitting in our state budget right now to satisfy the needs of charter schools. We have, and, and they're basically funds for vouchers that are not being used. Why would we allow such funds, such high amount of dollars to sit in um, you know, sit, sit in a, a budget or sit in the Treasury unused when we have such great need in different areas of our educational system. I just believe that the charter schools and public schools should not compete. Um, we need to make sure that everyone knows that these are both public schools. Charter schools, I, I just um, uh, witnessed a, a, a school closing because the vouchers could not uh, provide the necessary funding to stay open. So we have to do better and we have to build a better infrastructure for schools accepting vouchers and we have to accept a better, we have to develop a better system that finances every item uh, successfully. Um, I don't understand how an assembly can focus on reading programs when our, our teachers are not paid and when children go home without software and there's no opportunity for them to have the same uh, equity as a child who goes home to software whenever he wants. Right. So we, we just have infrastructure problems. Mm -hmm. We have gaps that are not addressed. It's as if there's no compassion. Mm -hmm. I believe my compassion and my love for people will provide a better system for our children to learn and for our teachers to uh, live stable lives. There has to be some compassion. Okay. Laws are fine. You know, Making, you know, um, writing bills. We have to write bills. We have to bring these laws into place to keep everybody right. in order. But we need passion and compassion to make sure that these gaps are closed. Right. So we've got about a minute left. Um, first, maybe some of your thoughts on 
the adult relationships around the governance piece. You as a state superintendent, your relationships with the state board, the governor, and the general assembly, what are three or four key things for you to do to make that an effective working relationship? I'm going to be honest. I'm a, I'm a tough uh, leader, but I'm a, like I said, I'm a compassionate leader. I'm very direct. Um, I never lie. I have a great relationship with the legislators. I, I write a public publication called City Political Magazine. Okay. It ran for numerous years from 2002 uh, through, I'm sorry, 2001 through 2008. And in that magazine, I highlight elected officials. So I have good relationships right now with many of the state legislators. And they will, they, these are hardworking legislators that deserve, um, that deserve to be engaged in our educational system, engaged in um, um, what will um, uh, best improve our, our state. So I, I, you know, my relationship with the governor is, is beautiful and perfect, I, I, but I'm, I would never simply, as superintendent, simply go along with what the governor is doing because we're both Democrats. Right. Um, and I believe Roy Cooper's going to win. <laughs> but I, and, and I do have a very good relationship with um, our Congresswoman Alma Adams. Um, I have a, a, a great relationships with um, Senator, Senator McKissick, um, uh, Joyce Waddell, okay. uh, Senator Joyce Waddell. Um, and I, I speak with them and communicate with them on a regular basis. And I know that that will be one asset that I have that I'm already in communications with our state legislators, state legislators and our U.S. Congress uh, members. Thank and you so much. Um, I have um, um, been working with them for years. Thank you so much for coming in and letting us know more Thank about you your so passion much, and your commitment. Best wishes. Thank you. Thank you. After this break, this week's final word. As we embrace the beginning of not only a new year, but a new decade, it's been encouraging to hear the thoughts and aspirations that many of our state thought leaders have expressed about the challenges and opportunities ahead of North Carolinians and our K-12 public education system. No doubt 2020 will be a critical year for public education in North Carolina. As we've discussed the past few months, we remain hopeful that when the General Assembly reconvenes in mid-January, negotiations are fruitful and an agreed upon two-year budget is finally passed and signed by the governor. The state has the resources to place a higher value in investing in our current students and teachers. Going even deeper into this year without a strong budget is not good for North Carolina and our students. In addition, the independent court-ordered report by West Ed released late last year in response to the 25-year-long school funding lawsuit known as Leandro documents the state's failure to meet its constitutional requirement for every student, regardless of where one lives, to receive a sound basic education. As such, this budget has the potential to be even more consequential than ever and should be the start of remedying our state's effort in addressing the need for targeted and substantial new investment in school funding. The second change our state's K-12 system is assured to see in 2020 is the election of a new state superintendent of public instruction. Thanks to Superintendent Mark Johnson's decision not to seek re-election over, over the past four decades, ongoing concerns have arisen from time about who is in charge of the state's public schools. The current governance of our state's public school system is based on a shared governance model between the governor, the appointed members of the State Board of Education, the elected state superintendent, and the leadership of our General Assembly. As we've seen over the past three years, this governance structure can result in extremely contentious and at times costly litigation and paralysis in public education policy and programs. This is distracting for our principals, teachers, and students as they seek to understand their mission, goals, and expectations. As a new cadre of state leaders are elected or re-elected to these most critical leadership roles in our state, let us expect of them, encourage them, and support them in making the goal of improving our educational system. That's it for this week's show. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.